basically talks about um, ill-defined, authentic, uh, authentic uh, situations, um, uh, etc. Mm -hmm. Can you comment about that and how they're built into your program? Yeah, sure. Um, so the the idea of, of having it to be ill-defined is, uh, you know, um, yes, we have some structure to 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 how our students actually build the games and how they define the games, but. Um, we basically, what we do is we give them features. Uh, every course defines a list of features. They're not necessarily, you have to do something in a particular way. Uh, it's more of, I have this feature on the, like, as if it was on the back of a game box. Um, you know, it has physics, right? Uh, that sort of thing. Or it has math, <laughs> you know? Um, but they, 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 it's up to the students and up to the groups to define what that means in their game. So that's sort of the ill-defined nature that, as how, how we use it. Um, basically, yeah, they're given these constraints. These constraints are essentially either, some of them are technological, like you have to include X, Y, Z, uh, but how you include it is up to them. Uh, and every, every group sort of is able to, to go beyond and think about how they are going to take these pieces and use them. Um, and, and, and you see a lot of creativity in that, uh, is what I find, is basically, um, I, like, you know, for instance, um, brief intro, uh, you can have a search algorithm for artificial intelligence called A star. It's, it's just a way to find a path between point A and point B in a nice, efficient way. And so that's for a data structures course, you know, they have to sort of understand how to how to do that in their in their game system, um, and it's usually like you know defining a grid and how that grid is defined and how you define you know blockages and walls and things like this. But as part of a, a standard data structures course, they get to understand the algorithm and how it works. But actually using it inside of a game, uh, they get to utilize it in in any way they like. I had uh, the usual way that you would use this algorithm as an example was is to have the AI character understand where the player is and how to get to the player more efficiently. But um, we, didn't def we didn't say that you had to do that. Uh, but So we just said you had to have A star implemented in your game. And what uh, one group did was really interesting and creative is they, they used the algorithm and they randomly generated two points and they, or three or like a few points and they said, I want to find uh, an efficient path in this graph with some random uh, things in between the, these two points, and I want you to find these paths. And so the algorithm would find the paths, and that path would, would, would actually, what they would do is instead of using that for the AI route, that would actually define the world and how, it, how the world actually looked. So it was like a, a randomized level designer. Um, so it was a very creative use of that, that, that algorithm. And you know, we didn't require that, um, but they, they came up with that all on their own. Uh, and that was that was quite a, a novel use of, of of these things that I didn't even think about, and uh, so it was it was quite uh, learning. It was a learning process for me as well. I mean, uh, that, that's an interesting point. If you don't mind a, a little bit of deviation at this point, um, can you comment about how do you actually support the students in terms of that that creative element? Um, do you do anything specifically to to try and enhance creativity, and if so, how do you go about doing that? <laughs> well, yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> um, yeah, as part of the workshop, what we try to do is we try to have like a lot of brainstorming sessions and and thinking outside of the box type of things, and so trying to spur creativity. Uh, it turns out that, that our students are fairly creative to begin with, and uh, <laughs> and we don't really have to give them too much in order to actually let them go. Um, I find that. Uh, the, the, the group of students that we, we currently have, we just basically say, as long as we give them some flexibility and we tell them that you're expected to be creative, then, then they will think of really interesting problems uh, and really interesting ways to, to solve these problems. So, uh, so I'm very uh, surprised at those sometimes, but uh, yeah, in, in, in a good way. <laughs> right. Um, one last question, because we're quickly running out of time. Um, I, I was going to ask you something about the incorporation of realistic multimedia video uh, simulations, etc., into the game development field. And uh, I'm asking essentially about your views of the incorporation of realism. I mean, you talked about how realistic the actual process needs to be so mm -hmm. students envision themselves uh, as part of a team at the end of the day. 
but here I'm thinking about the incorporation of realism into the actual structure of the game itself. How big of a role does that play? How, is, how important is it? And if it is important, why is it important? Mm. Like in terms of the actual game itself that they build? Yeah, I try always to steer them away from highly realistic uh, video games for a couple of reasons. One is uh, it's really difficult to do. <laughs> uh, it's really hard to build something that looks real. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of time. Um, they're, you know, I'm I'm not a big fan of of highly realistic looking games anyway myself. Um, but you know, I, I like more style stylization. It's sort of more artistic and more creative in that that aspect, but more abstract, so I guess. When you're talking about realism, then you're talking about um, realism from the perspective of how closely aligned the video is to. Sure, yeah. But that's one aspect of it, right? Yeah. Well, earlier, we've actually talked about other aspects of realism as well. Uh, we talked about um, how realistic or immersible the storyline might be. Can you comment perhaps about that aspect of realism? Yeah, like, like any storytelling medium, um, you have to have some sort of realism. Uh, <laughs> at least some sort of believability to your characters. It doesn't necessarily have to be reality. Uh, it just has to be believ believability, right? So you have to be able to believe these characters, you know. Um, we don't, uh, we don't watch Star Trek because it's real, right? Because it's close to our reality. It's, it's a reality that we would love to exist in a sense, right? Uh, um, but even the original series, you know, we would, we, we, we bought into that world even though it was very fantastic only because of the believability of the characters and the situations that they were put in. Um, so yeah, we encourage students to ensure that they have that amount of detail inside of their stories that they develop, inside of their game ideas that they, that they develop in order to enhance the, the believability of the process as well. Um, that, that, that's less of an issue um, in some of, the, some, some of the, the courses that we have, but yeah, we'd certainly definitely talk about that all, all throughout. <laughs> you're talking about here, from my understanding, is that realism exists within the contextual kind of detail that you're putting into the game, so that the whoever the individual is who's going to be playing these games can actually see themselves as part of that or playing a role within that particular game. Yeah, yeah, and interaction plays a, plays a big role in that. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, I've, I've played a lot of really interesting games in the past little while that have sort of broken the idea inside my head that, that uh, games have to be sort of realistic in terms of every aspect of their story, et cetera. Um, I played a, a really, uh, I highly recommend this game. Uh, you guys, it's free, you should download it. Uh, it's called Passage uh, by Jason Rohrer, R-O-H-R-E-R. -R -E um, it is an excellent, excellent game. It is five minutes of gameplay, um, but it's an old pixel art, eight bit kind of style. Uh, but it has the most fantastic story, and it has no no words in the entire story. So um, it's it is certainly a, a, a really re interesting piece of art that spoke to me and actually made me emotional. Um, it was the first game that actually made me feel some emotion. Um, you know, I always tell my students this, uh, and, and and I always ask them what what they feel as well with this game because it's. It's quite interesting and made me cry and made me, you know, it was actually quite interesting. And there's, there's also some other games like uh, The Marriage, uh, which you can download as well, which, which is just like squares and circles. And, um, and it has a very touching, heartfelt story in it as well with very little, with very few words. So, uh, you know, believability is, is, is interesting, but it doesn't necessarily have to be even words. Um, it can be how you interact with the system. Um, and how things are taken away from you uh, inside that system, and how things are added to the system, um, you know, willfully or or unwillfully. Um, you know, that all those things sort of work together in concert to 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 create emotion, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be words. Is the sort of the interesting part about games? Right? Well, the the other side of the uh, other end of the extreme, of course, is you know one of the original command line type, type of games like Zork where it was only words, there was no graphics to it at all, and it still had the effect, well, maybe it was just us uh, techno-weeds or, or geeks or whatever, but I found it very, very uh, immersible. 
Oh, absolutely. Well, it's like, you know, choose your own adventure book or something, right? You know, books themselves are, are, are highly immersive and, and, and there's no interaction, right? So you can sit down and really feel that you're inside that story, um, which I find really fascinating that people will actually feel present inside that story world. Um, and with, without any graphics, just with text of their own imagination. And sometimes that, that imagination is the important piece. And so when I see that video games are trying to come up with higher, higher uh, and higher realism, I, I feel that, that it's taking away from our immersion in, in a lot of ways. And, and um, it's, uh, it's a well-known uh, sort of effect in uh, psychology. You can look at sort of this thing called the uncanny valley, that basically as realism goes up, immersion goes up, right? So they've looked at this, and they've shown that people feel more present in simulations as the realism increases, up until a point when it gets close to reality, but not quite, because we're human and we, you know, through evolution and through our, our, own, our own past experience, understand how humans look and feel and talk and et cetera and move. And the minute, all of a sudden, you get to a point where you expect it to be real, but it isn't quite there, you break the immersion, it goes, dips way down. And, 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 you, and you lose that, that feeling that you're there and you realize that you're just playing in some simulation or some game and it's ineffective at, at that point. So I'm more, on the, uh, I, I'm more, of, more of the thought process that um, if you don't give that realism, but you give the realism in terms of interaction, in terms of story, in terms of something, but not in terms of graphics or animation, um, you can do it in other ways in, in that, that don't conflict with our visual system and uh, that can be more believable in a lot of ways. Okay, great. Um, unfortunately, we've about run out of time. I, I'd like to thank you so very much for uh, giving up your, your time and your insights as to um, how game development and uh, the process that you've got um, working at um, the Faculty of Business and IT within the gaming program um, interacts with PBL, and uh, on behalf of my students, I'd like to thank you for. Great, well, thank you.